the most important decision we make is what we put in our mouths. And so if there's any decision that should be built based on evidence, and we should demand evidence, there's only one diet ever proven to reverse heart disease in the majority of patients, plant-based diet. If there's one thing you need to know, number one killer of men and women, only diet ever proven to reverse in the majority of patients, plant-based diet. So the only way that wouldn't argue for it being the default diet for everyone is if it so dramatically increased your risk of, you know, killers two through 15 or something uh -huh. such that it would overwhelm the heart disease benefit. And instead you tend to see a benefit in neutral effects across the board. It's just the whole system is rigged kind of against us. You know, the, the CEOs of junk food companies aren't sitting around trying to think of creative ways to contribute to the childhood obesity epidemic. They just need to make money for their shareholders. How do you do that? You don't do that selling something that goes bad, like produce, that you can't brand. You, you want a snack cake that sits on the shelf, right? I mean, the system is just set up to reward these behaviors that make people sick. That's Dr. Michael Greger, and this is The Rich Roll Podcast. The Rich Roll Podcast. Hey, everybody, what's good? I'm Rich Roll. This is my podcast. Welcome to it. I can almost promise that today's episode is going to leave you ready to ramp up your plant based intake. So, to help you form a new routine, we created an online platform that makes going, and most importantly, staying plant forward easy and delicious. It's called the Plant Power Meal Planner. And for just $1.90 a week, when you sign up for a year, it provides you with access to thousands, literally thousands of delicious, nutritious, easy to prepare plant-based recipes, thoroughly customized to your specific preferences with access to a team of experienced nutrition coaches seven days a week. It also automatically creates simple grocery lists based on selected recipes and even integrates with grocery delivery in most urban areas. So everything you need to eat the way that you deserve magically arrives at your doorstep. To learn more and sign up, visit meals.richroll.com or click meal planner on the top of any page on my website, richroll.com, because one of the most important decisions we make every day, multiple times a day, is what we put in our mouths. But here's the unfortunate thing. The discussion, the information that's swirling around the internet about nutrition tends to be a toxic stew, a hotly debated, metastasizing mushroom cloud of half-truths and misinformation. So how do we sort through the tribal wars? How do we separate fact from fiction? Well, we can start with seeking out the experts. And how about we default to the best, most objective science available to arrive at the facts that live beyond dispute? Well, this is the life's work of today's guest, my friend, Dr. Michael Greger. Longtime listeners are well acquainted with this beautiful man, one of the OG guests on the show, all the way back to episode seven. And he also graced us again on RRP 199. But I can't believe it's been five years since I've talked to this treasure of a man. That's just not right. So today we're going to put matters to rights. A graduate of Cornell and Tufts University School of Medicine, as well as a founding member and fellow of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, Dr. Greger is a globally lauded nutrition science wizard. He's the guy behind nutritionfacts.org the world's most authoritative, nonprofit, science-based public service destination for all things nutrition, health, and disease prevention. He's appeared everywhere from the Dr. Oz Show to the Colbert Report, and his books, How Not to Die, the How Not to Die Cookbook, and How Not to Diet, which is the focus of today's conversation, all became instant New York Times bestsellers. And I think it's worth noting that in an effort for him to remain completely free of conflicts of interest, 100% of all fees and proceeds that he receives from his many speaking engagements and all of his book sales are completely donated to charity. There's a bunch more I want to say about the good Dr. G and the conversation to come, but first, on the subject of making healthy eating delicious and convenient, we're brought to you today by Daily Harvest. Do you ever have those days where you just grab a handful of whatever snack you can find in the pantry and just call it lunch. 
That is called satiation, not nourishment. And don't get me wrong, I do it too in between workouts or recording sessions. Sometimes I just throw down a bag of cashews and call it a meal. This is why I'm all about Daily Harvest. Here's a lowdown. Basically, Daily Harvest is organic, farm-frozen, pre-prepared, thoughtfully sourced fruit and vegetable meals like sweet potato and wild rice hash, which I like to top off with an avocado, or lentil tomato bolognese. This is stuff you don't have time to make, but it's delivered right to your door. Everything at Daily Harvest is built on fruits and vegetables, no preservatives, no added sugar, no artificial ingredients. Everything stays super fresh in your freezer until you're ready to enjoy it. And the variety is huge. You can choose from more than 65 different options. They've got tons of incredible smoothies, hearty soups, harvest bowls, and flatbreads. Each recipe takes just one step to prepare, and it's ready in five minutes or less. I love them. My kids love them, especially my 12-year-old daughter, and she, my friends, is not an easy sell. Plus, everything is crazy fresh. Daily Harvest works directly with farms, and they freeze organic fruits and vegetables at peak ripeness to lock in nutrients and taste. So stop overthinking your meals for the week. Go to dailyharvest.com and enter my promo code RICHROLL to get $25 off your first box. That's promo code RICHROLL for $25 off your first box at dailyharvest.com. That's dailyharvest.com, promo code RICHROLL. We're also brought to you today by Shippo. I can tell you firsthand from watching my wife, Julie, birth her plant-based cheese company, Shrimu, that the number one challenge for e-commerce businesses is shipping. Customers expect it to be flawless. So if you can't get that dialed in and affordable, you're screwed. Well, Shippo was founded to solve this problem for businesses both large and small. Not only can their volume discount save you up to 90% off carrier rates, 90%, that's insane. It's the only shipping software for growing businesses that you can start right now, set up in minutes, and then ship your goods today. But perhaps even more valuable is the time and ease they can save you. All you got to do is connect your online store to Shippo, and they will instantly identify the lowest shipping rates from 55-plus top global carriers. Your orders are automatically pulled in and ready to go. Just click, print, and ship. Plus, automated return labels are free. You only pay if your customers use them. So stop being held hostage by your carrier. Get Shippo today. And right now, Shippo has an incredible offer. Get a shipping consultation and Shippo Pro Plan six-month trial for free at goshippo.com slash richroll. That's up to a $700 value for free at goshippo.com slash richroll. Go right now and get your shipping consultation and Shippo Pro Plan six-month trial for free at goshippo.com slash richroll. So... You've perfected that sourdough recipe you've been working on for years. You've got your small business license and the orders, they're starting to pour in. Customers are spreading the word. So what is stopping you from making your side gig a dream job? A website. It's about damn time you made a website that's just as awesome as the bread you've been baking, whether that bread is real or metaphorical. And if you can bake a loaf of bread, I can assure you that you can build a beautiful site with Squarespace. To me, the coolest thing about Squarespace is their all-in-one platform, which hosts a variety of templates you can choose from and play around with and try out for different looks on your website. And don't worry, Squarespace's intuitive and easy-to-use tools and customizable specs gives you the freedom to craft a site that is authentic to you. You don't need to know how to code. You don't have to be some kind of graphic wizard. All you got to do is be you. So stop putting your business goals on hold. Make your next move with a stunning website from Squarespace. Just go to squarespace.com forward slash richroll and make sure to use the offer code richroll at checkout to get 10% off your first purchase. That's squarespace.com slash richroll, offer code richroll to get 10% off your first page. Okay, Dr. Michael Greger. So today's conversation is about first and foremost, how not to diet the optimal criteria to enable weight loss, and the actionable steps required to replace constant weight loss struggles with simple and sustainable lifestyle practices. But it's also about 
the corrosive corruption of commercial influences within the nutrition space. It's about how to digest the incredibly conflicting information we're spoon-fed every day by the media and celebrities alike. And it's about separating evidence-based science from confirmation bias. I should note that this was recorded pre-COVID back in February, so this is a coronavirus-free conversation. However, if you would like Dr. G's take on our current situation, you are in luck as this week, just a couple days ago, he released a new audiobook entitled How to Survive a Pandemic, which is all about the origins of these types of diseases, how to protect ourselves, and what we must rectify to reduce the likelihood of future catastrophes. So check that out. Dr. G is truly one of the most delightful, relentless, passionate, and service-minded humans I've ever met. I think you guys are going to really dig this one. So without further ado, please meet the inimitable and amazing Michael Greger, MD. So good to see you. It's been a couple of years. Um, but I think about you all the time, man. You, you're just, you're out there. You have more energy. You are more relentless than almost anybody I've ever met. It's crazy. You were just saying that you're doing how many lectures? I got uh, 200 cities uh-huh. and sometimes more wow. than one lecture per 200 city. 200 cities? Sometimes, two, you know, different cities in the right. same day, you know, over 10 months. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. So when yeah, people brutal. say... You know, yeah, I'd, I'd really like to eat better, yeah, but, but I, I travel right, too much. Energy, right, right. Nobody travels as much energy. as you do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't think I've ever met anybody who travels as much as you do. Well, but it's just I'm on like a three-year book cycle. So it's yeah. only one out of three years. So I write right. a book a year, then I'm on the road for a year. But then I got, you know, and then I got to write three years worth of videos for Nutrition Facts, and then I write the next book. So, so do you whiteboard that all out in oh, yeah. advance so got, you know four, what your books yeah, are oh, yeah. down the line and all of yeah, that? Yeah, to like 2042 or something right. like that, yeah. And when do you – how do you apportion that? So you have – all the videos coming out on Nutrition Facts. Right. You got the books, it's, it's, you got the lectures, right, right. you're never home. And when you are home, you're on a walking desk. <laughs> like, how does this work? Yeah, yeah. No, no. So people were like, well, I love the video. You Like, how'd you do the video today? You were uh, in the plane. As if, you know, I'm like, you right. know, it's like real That's, time. I did that video a year ago, right? I, literally. Wow. Right. So I do, I script three years worth mm. of videos every three years. Wow. Um, And so you just... Hope and pray that broccoli is still good for you next year because, you know, it's, it's right. set in stone. Has that ever happened where the science has changed yeah. and you had to pull the video? Yeah, pull video. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, usually in, in, in fa- there's even stronger evidence or, or, you know, in the same kind of direction. But now there's we finally have something that really clinches it. Yeah. Uh, more, than, more than anything right. else. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you were one of my very first guests on this show, episode seven, I think, Honored. going all the way Honored. back. Then we did a second one where there was a technical snafu. We were at some conference and we did right, it right. and it didn't record. That's right, only right. happened like three or four times mm. in seven years, but you were you you fell victim Yet to that. another trendsetter. I know, I, know, I tell you. And then uh, the last time that we did this, I think was four years ago. Wow. So Long time. it seems like yesterday because yeah, yeah, yeah. you're in my heart all the Aww. time. <laughs> what is the, uh, the current lecture all about? Because I know you, you're constantly up. Do you change it for every audience or you have kind of a lockdown thing that you do yeah. every year? Yeah. So, uh, so now, so I used to do a, a new talk every year because uh-huh. I was, I was traveling right. every year, but now I'm only traveling, you know, after the new book. So I just have the new book talk. And so for new audiences, they get the last book talk. Uh-huh. Um, but for audiences that have already seen it, the How Not to Die talk, I give the How Not to Die it, the weight loss talk. That's right. what I'm doing now. So this is the new right. book. I actually like the old one. I mean, so my uh, the last talk, the How Not to Die talk, is my favorite talk. Mm. I mean, it just has more humor than any other talk. I mean, so it, my preference, and it's like perfectly memorized. Like I can, I can like, you know, think about my grocery list while I'm giving it. Like, I mean, it's just like <laughs> completely. It so right. Times. And, but it's so, but, and. And the the new, you know, I'm I'm reading off the of notes on a podium, uh-huh. and it's you know it's going to be a while before. And just when I get really good at it, pff, you and know, I never give it's it. It's like like right. a stand up comedian. <laughs> you got to do you tape your special, and then you got to retire the material. It's all over. But right? in your case, this material it has a longer shelf it, life it though. Like, right. it, this stuff doesn't doesn't necessarily age. You know, it's crazy. You know? So how not to die? 
um, is selling better now than it did the month after release back wow. in like 2016. Yeah, I mean, that's sold just insane. Over three quarter of a million copies, right? Yeah, about yeah, about wow. that. Wow, and 100 yeah, yeah. percent of all proceeds go to charity. Go to charity for all yeah. my books. Yeah, we're talking a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This last one, I, I donated more than a million dollars this year. Wow. Yeah, very very cool. And I would suspect that that a big part of that, other than just being, you know compassionate in your heart is to basically rebut the argument that you're conflicted. You have, you're selling a yeah. book, so yeah. you're, you're, you're anchored in this position. And no matter what the evidence says, you've got to toe this line because you're financially incentivized. Right. Although there's still the ideological kind of conflicts of interest. So mm -hmm. even, even people that aren't necessarily profiting off of their work, I mean, they still may be t wedded to some idea um, so I, it doesn't completely divorce me from the, right. from, you know, you know, concern over bias. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, with so much, the, the corrosive corruption of, of, of commercial influences. Well, let's within, talk about that. Within, I mean, medicine in general, but mm -hmm. nutrition in particular, where, you know, this, I mean, the, you know, the confirmation bias is just so extreme. In no other field have I ever seen such a thing. It's pretty bananas right now. I feel like there's a mushroom cloud of information. Like if you're in the Twitter sphere, it's just, it's insane. Um, the siloed, you know, kind of tribal wars that are going on right now are so emotional and acerbic. Yeah. It's, it's quite toxic. So how do you, I mean, you post your stuff. I've noticed like you don't engage in any mm. of that. You kind of just stay above yeah. the fray. Yeah. No, that, yeah. And that was a conscious mm -hmm. decision to be like, well, this is all the science that I could find on this. And so there's, unless, I mean, and so the only, you'll notice on Nutrition Facts, the only comments I respond to is, what about this study? Or, you know, what about this study? Uh -huh. You know, and because it's very possible, I, maybe I missed that study. I mean, you know, I mean, we got a huge research staff now, but, you know, I want to make sure that, that I put that into the, into the calculus when I came out with what I consider the best available balance of evidence. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, this is the science. So there's really nothing anyone can say, um, you know, I mean, and so, and, and it's really not like, you know, most of my videos, I try really hard to be like, this is not, I have no opinion on this. Here's the science. Make up your own mind. Uh -huh. I mean, it convinced me to do X, Y, and Z, but if you're not convinced by the evidence, you know, wait till you know, right. something else drops. But, well, you must, you must get the criticism that you're cherry picking studies. Like you have to make a decision about what studies you're going to highlight in these videos, right? So that's why, that's why it takes me forever to write the videos because uh -huh. I have to make sure. So not just some new study, but where that new study exists in the context of every other study that's ever been published ever, right? I mean, so- How many studies get published a year? Well, I mean, so just- Like uh, legitimate. So, uh, well, so in uh, the, in obesity, just, just in the field of obesity, um, there's uh, over a hundred thousand studies every, so that's like, wow. you know, I mean, so it's like, you know, I go to sleep and I'm already like, you know, I'm, I'm way behind. You do sleep. I, I uh, well, that, I'm working on it, but. <laughs> you talk uh, about that in the new book. I know. Do you practice no, that? It is so depressing to look at the uh -huh. sleep medicine literature because I just realized, oh, oh, that's a, I'm going to, that horrible thing's going to happen to me. <laughs> oh, that. Yeah. This is the one blind spot oh, in your, oh, your regimen. Oh, God, that's, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I just, I find myself, I'm so much less productive when I'm unconscious. Yeah. That, uh, you know. So thousand studies a year on obesity alone. Hundred thousand. A hundred thousand. Oh my God. I mean, so, so how do you just, even wade yeah, through yeah, this yeah. and figure out, so, yeah. you know, what's, what's worth looking at yeah. and, you know, what's really worth exploring and digging into and, and, and ultimately I would imagine deconstructing at times to figure out what's, you know, what, ho what holds up to your standards and what doesn't. Yeah, so there was over, so we have over 100 research volunteers that churn through. That's how we can get through tens mm -hmm. of thousands of studies every year. Um, just because we have, you know, all these like retired docs that are just sitting around and just have a hobby of helping me out, basically. Uh -huh. um, and so at any one time, we have nearly 200 active uh, volunteers. And so, I mean, we can just, we can just churn through so much and... You know, I have access. I have people in libraries, in right. every major library anywhere, who will pull any study from any. You know, so I have someone that will just go to the NIH, you know, largest medical library in the world, and pull any old study that isn't even online. So I have access to everything, and I'm just in this incredibly privileged position to be able to, you know. But that's 
assuming the literature all says one thing. Right. The reason why this new obesity book, the, the weight loss book, was such a bear, the hardest thing I've ever taken on in my life was because it's incredibly conflicting. Mm. And so if, you know, 100 studies say one thing and others 100 studies say another thing, you have to say, well, wait a second, what is it about the way they did the studies, the, the populations, the exclusion criteria? Like, what was it that you could arrive at such disparate conclusions using very similar kind of methods? And that took forever. So simple questions like skip breakfast or not skip breakfast, mm -hmm. exercise before or after a meal, or I mean, these like really like these are a thousand article research questions. There's a thousand articles on, <laughs> and you're just like, wait a second, this is two pages of the book. Maybe one, maybe it's a little sidebar. Uh -huh. And, and it's people all, just like, want to know: Should I eat breakfast I or shouldn't I? And you no, know, and you know, I get a should lot I of fast. I get a lot Tell of that me what feedback. To do. I get, that's. That's what everyone's like. Okay, you I don't know, care. Like, like just these give me the series. thing. I know, be, right? Yeah. Be my guru, right? Yeah. Um, and that, but that, but the, you know, anyone fall? I mean, that's that's the antithesis of, of what I want to. You know, that's the problem. Is people just, you know, just mm -hmm. follow what someone says, and as if we were born with this knowledge. I mean, we. I mean, when it comes to something as life and death important as what to feed yourself and your family, then if there's anything we should. Uh, any decision we should make best based on evidence, it should be something like that. If you're online buying a toaster, then the random opinions of strangers may actually be really useful. Like, oh, I like this one. Okay, uh -huh. but when it, but you know, when I was when I was in practice, and someone came to me, I say, well, you know, why are you eating this particular? Eh, someone at the gym told me to, you know, eat this with. Right. I'm like. Really? I mean, you're, you, you, the checkout aisle magazine <laughs> is the reason yeah. that you're feeding your kids? The, I mean, you realize that what we eat is the number one cause of death and disability in the United States. I mean, the most important decision we make is what we put in our mouths. And so if there's any decision that should be built based on evidence, and we should demand evidence, and not just a citation, but show me the evidence. I want to see it for myself. To make sure you didn't take it out of context. I mean that this is this is and so that's that's. But you and I both know well that even the most well-intentioned consumer who begins to explore this, whether online or whatever, they're going to find conflicting information out there, and it appears to have equal merit. It's like it's like when you turn on the news and there's ten people yelling at each other at the same time. Even if one of them is completely Looney Tunes, it appears that they're standing on equal footing, right? right? So. You know, you can find studies that will support whatever perspective or confirmation bias that you have, and it becomes very difficult for that well-meaning, you know, intelligent person to separate, you know, the chaff from, you know, the cream when right. it comes to this. The, so this is yeah. where you come in, but even then, it's like, all right, well, you're sifting through thousands and thousands of these studies and realizing, well, this is complicated, and even even good science seems to conflict. You know, how do you make heads or tails of that? I, I can't judge somebody who's like, you know, Dr. Greger, just like, what is it? Tell me, right, give me the yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, no, you understand. You know, it's like that. And there's lots of problems with the, you know, peer-reviewed medical literature. Um, you know, it's like that, uh, I don't know if Winston Churchill after, actually said it, but attributed uh -huh. to Winston Churchill, you know, a democracy worst form of government except for all the others, mm -hmm. right? And it's the same thing. I mean, it's like the peer-reviewed scientific literature, it's the best we have. I mean, it's the worst we have except for all the others. I mean, that, that's what else can we do but abide by, um, you know, what's been, you know, published in, in, in the medical literature. But there's uh, lots of problems with industry bias and, mm -hmm. you know, funding effects. And and so that's why you really need to, I mean, first thing I do when I look at a study, who paid for the study, where is it coming from? Just so you can read it with that lens. Doesn't right. mean it's necessarily a bad yeah, study. Exactly. But still be a good study. Still be a good yeah. study. Um, but you want to read it with that, you know, to, you want to, you know, take it with extra special grain of salt and look at the materials and methods and really make sure they didn't, create this, they didn't produce the study in a way to get some desired result. They were actually coming into it really, you know, looking right. to, to, to learn something. And despite the fact that you've read countless thousands of these studies, you know, you've been on board with the whole food plant-based diet for decades at this point. Um, do you ever come across a study that contravenes some long-held truth that you've held? Like, have you ever had to mature update your 
thoughts on things? All like how, how has that yeah, evolution yeah. been? Yeah, no, look, I mean, anyone who's saying the same thing about nutrition that they were saying a few years ago obviously hasn't been keeping track of the literature. I mean, the reason I can do new, I could do new videos every day forever is just because there's this tremendous wealth of information out there. Now, usually it's just kind of nibbling at the edges. Like after How Not to Die came out, I realized that, oh, and I was telling people, oh, you got to toast your walnuts and sesame seeds. It just makes your kitchen mm -hmm. smell so wonderful. And that's great. And they taste so wonderful. Then this paper came out and talked about these AGEs, these advanced glycation end products, these glycotoxins found in high fat, high protein foods exposed to high dry heat temperatures. Traditionally, it's like frankfurters and stuff and chicken McNuggets, but nuts, you put them at those temperatures and they create these nasty. Uh -huh. And so I, now I tell people to eat the raw nuts, but that's the nice thing about a video where it's like an update as opposed to the book, which is already out, but um, you know, in reprints, we can get it. But I mean, right. so little things like but these so are like nuts details. are still good, but, yeah. um, but I mean, there, you can find studies all the time saying, you know, uh, you know, bacon and butter is good for you, just like the tobacco uh, lobby would come literally with piles of studies to these congressional hearings. Say this is not this is not the research that says smoking is neutral. This is the literature saying smoking is good for you. It helps with Parkinson's disease and ulcerative colitis. And and a lot of this is true because it's immunosuppressive and sort of autoimmune disease. You smoke, you kill your immune system. You're your autoimmune disease gets better. Inflammatory <laughs> bowel disease gets better. Yeah. But I mean, these are legit studies um, showing smoking beneficial. Now, of course, that's not the best available balance of evidence because you're going to die right. a horrific death from lung cancer. But you can. But those studies exist, and you can cherry pick them out. And that's why. Um, uh, I mean, that's why you know every single every every day a video comes out. I send the video to every single principal investigator of every article I cite and be like, I'm excited to, here's your research, you know, um, in hopes that one will be like, you, 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 you misinterpreted or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I can immediately, you know, kind of. Right. So when that. you, when you get like, what is your response when somebody criticizes you and says, he's just, you know, he's a plant-based guy. He's always going to be a plant-based guy. He's got his own confirmation bias. This is a mm -hmm. guy who's a, really just an animal rights activist who's who shrouded himself in a in a medical frock i mean it's like uh i mean it's like uh, you know some some uh you know pulmonologist saying oh you're just an anti-cigarette guy i mean that your only reason you're telling people not to smoke to get is because you know you have a well-known record of you were against cigarettes 10 years ago before the study comes out oh a new study comes out saying smoking's bad for you oh, mr anti-cigarettes is that <laughs> it again um i mean the science is the science mm -hmm. um and you know the, the charges of cherry picking so there, for example there's only one diet ever proven to reverse heart disease, the majority of patients plant-based diet. Number one killer of men and women. Like, shouldn't that be the default diet until proven otherwise? Only one. So it's hard to cherry pick when there's only one cherry. Like, there's no other. Now, in the future, maybe some new diet will be shown to. But I mean, until that happens, and this happens over and over again with multiple sclerosis and Crohn's disease and on down the list, nothing's been shown to work better. And there's just, I mean, you know. So right. Right. I mean, yeah. listen, you said it, but the fact that heart disease, you know, basically kills more people than anything else. And this is the one protocol that actually will not only prevent it, but reverse it if you have it. Like, why are we even exploring anything further? And the fact and so that it's can, amazing that yeah. it be, it's so controversial. And the fact that can also help prevent arrest or reverse other leading killers, type 2 diabetes mm -hmm. and high blood pressure. We seem to make the case for plant-based eating just like simply overwhelming at this point, right? I mean, if that's all right, if there's one thing you need to know, number one killer men and women, only diet ever proven reverse in the majority of patients, plant-based diet. So the only way that wouldn't argue for it being the default diet for everyone is if it so dramatically increased your risk of, you know, killers two through 15 or something uh -huh. such that it would overwhelm the heart disease benefit. And instead you just see, you tend to see a benefit in neutral effects across the board. Right. Well, you've got to be thrilled to see this movement, this way of eating and living, you know, kind of explode over recent years. I mean, mm -hmm. never before in your career, you know, have we seen, such a crazy adoption rate, um, which is super exciting. But there's also a lot of pushback now, mm. and we have these sort of other diets that are you know, rising to the surface and, and you know, challenging for their moment in the sun. 
Um, and, and, and it makes me realize, or I guess appreciate just how emotional all of this is. I, it's not, it's, it's really not, um, an information war as much as it is a psychological mm. war. You know what I mean? Like, cause you've spent decades putting mm. information out. I mean, nobody Love puts it. out more information yeah. about this than you do. And if somebody's resistant to that, that's their choice. But I feel like the battle really needs to be waged on how to win hearts and minds, and not just the minds, but the hearts. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, how, what is, what, and I, I'm interested in, you know, whether you have thought about this, you know, with respect to the newest book, it's like weight loss, like everybody wants to lose weight, mm. right? But often it's not, it's not the information, it's the implementation mm. of the information and, and what gets in the way of people taking that information and putting it into action has to do with their own psychological makeup and, you know, the emotional landscape and, you know, the, the, the social construct in which they live their lives. Uh, you know, when I, uh, you know, at some of these, you know, amazing plant-based nutrition healthcare conferences now, which now attract thousands right. of, I mean, it's just amazing. You know, the number one question I have for everyone is like, how did you come across it? Like, obviously they didn't learn about it in, in medical school. None of us did. Like, how did you come? And most frequently, the answer I get is because a patient taught them. Like, so they've had these patients forever and they've known their whole families and they've had diabetes and, you know, they're just trying to slow the rate at which they go blind and lose their kidney function and lower limbs. And then all of a sudden they come in, they're 20 pounds lighter, they're, they're, they need to, they're dramatically over medicated all of a sudden, they have to pull back all the drugs and the doctor's like, what happened? And the patient says, oh, I saw folks over knives or, you know, game changers or something. And then all of a sudden, um, and, I, I mean, and the doctor in the back of the mind, doctor saying, I got like 2,000 patients just like you. What is going on? And that's so, f and so it's, it's just great, but it's upside down. Oh my God. And so <laughs> yeah. it drives me crazy. And so I'm like, wait a second. I've, I've got a stack this big of peer-reviewed scientific literature, randomized controlled trials proving reversal of these diseases, yet it was one little anecdote, one person comes to you, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> but, it's, but, it's, yeah. but it's that human connection. Uh -huh. We're like storied creatures, like all the data in the world, you know, all, you know it'll, you know, I, I, some people are open to that, but other people, they just need to see it in front of their face. or And so, I don't know. So that's, that's why I think the more popular it gets, the easier it'll be when they see their friends and family, the transformations, then it'll click that. And of course, I'll be in the background banging my head against the wall saying, right. hello, Here's this, this is the <laughs> 70s, yeah. right? Pentagon was reversing our disease in the 70s. How many people have died since then? Needlessly, over 100,000 people every year, heart disease <sighs> in the United States alone. I mean, that much suffering, it should anger people, right? I mean, the, 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 the reaction to someone who, who just doesn't have to go through, you know, open heart surgery anymore isn't, shouldn't be relief. Oh my God, I don't have to get my chest cracked open. And now I get to live a long, happy life and see my grandkids grow up. It should be like, how, why didn't anyone tell me mm, this before? Right. I mean, outrage. Outrage. It's, yeah. Yeah. Of these 200 cities that you visit, all the speeches that you give, how many of them are, at medical schools or hospitals, because I, yeah. obviously, like the way to get to the root of this is to is to educate medical students and create a better ecosystem around care. Yeah, train the trainers. That's really what I'm doing now. Is mostly talking yeah. to professional audiences. I'm talking tonight um, uh, at a medical center. The and lots of medical schools now, but. And that's how I actually started out. My kind of speaking career is going. In fact, that was my goal is to speak at every single medical school every two years mm -hmm. to hit every single new grad coming out. I have a whole new generation of docs learning this. But I realized, like, that's too slow. Like, they're not, they're still going to be in training for another five years, and then they got to get out. And then they, I mean, so, like, people are dying now. When it comes to safe, simple, side effect free solutions like stop smoking, eat healthier. You don't need your doctor to tell you to do that. We can take this directly to the people with this kind of democratization yeah. of information now available. Um, and so I, you know, so then that's how nutritionfacts.org got born. Right. Instead of for, forget the doctors, you know, let them come around eventually. We got to right. People are dying right now. People need to know. And then, of course, it's up to you. It's your body, your choice. You want to go smoke cigarettes, go bungee jump and do whatever you want. But you know, there at least you should be, you know, educated about the predictable consequences yeah. of your actions. Other than your unbridled enthusiasm for this, one of the things that's that that I like about you and that's interesting about you is that you really 
strive to st stand outside of dogma and you're mm -hmm. not telling people what to do. You're just, you're, you're, you're basically in a very objective way presenting the information and allowing people to do with it as they will. Yeah. I mean, that's always been really important to me is, and look, and for whatever reason, I mean, there's no judgment. I, I mean, I happen to have the background that enabled me to do this work and to be who I am. I mean, there are people struggling with all sorts of things that you don't know about. And the fact that they're still eating, you know, crap on their home, you know, way home from work. I mean, you, you have no idea what's going on in their lives that yeah. led them to whatever. But should they have the opportunity to really, you know, whether it's a health scare or whatever, to be like, I really need to clean up my act. At least there should be a place they can go where here's the information. This mm -hmm. is what I wish I learned in medical school and, you know, do with it. What Geek out on nutrition fat. I mean, how uh, many hours of videos do you have on there now? So we have uh, oh, thousands, oh thousands, plural. So we have yeah. over 2,000 videos now. Uh, Basically, you go to the site and you could just search whatever food or whatever ailments yeah. and you've got it covered. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but run I mean, out yeah, of like, yeah. no, but it's, <laughs> new, it's, what, what's the new video going to be? Oh, there's always yeah. new stuff. I'm constantly, uh, I mean, there's just always new, yeah. you know. And, you know, so I do it two ways. One through, I run through all the topics, actually, alphabetically. Anyone who's keeping uh, real close attention will be like, oh, so the olive oil came after the... The nuts, which came after the, you know, yeah. um, but, uh, and then I just go through and read all the, every issue of every single English language nutrition journal in the world. See, because there may be topics I don't even know to look up. Mm -hmm. There's this, yeah. I mean, all sorts of new hormones and new right. receptors and new, I was just working on the plane on this CD36 receptor. Whoa, blew my mind. <laughs> videos even, like, to be cut, the videos yeah, we, to come, right? We get sidetracked on that. It sounds like an air, it sounds like a <laughs> airplane to me, like a C-130. Right, I don't right. even know what that oh, is. Oh my God, amazing. In terms of, of taking it to the people, which you've been doing, uh, the real needle mover, I think, has been this slew of documentaries that, is, that have come amazing. out over the last amazing. decade. The, the, the most recent of which is, of course, Game Changers. And you were the scientific technical advisor on that movie, yeah, right? Yeah. So what did that look like? What, what was your involvement? I mean, that, uh, well, I mean, just, I mean, certainly uh, for, uh, to take that first point, when I go around and speak and ask people on these, you know, four hour book signing lines, how did this, it's what the health, it's forks over knives, mm -hmm. it's these, these documentaries are now just really, yeah, yeah, uh, tremendous oversized effects. Right. And so if people, if they're funders interested in getting this, you know, movement off the off the ground, I think that's a, a decent way to go. Yeah. Well, they're probably good investments. These movies do very well. They do. And they, yeah, know. they do. So, yeah, yeah no. So, uh, so yeah. So I was approached um, by James Wilkes, oh, God, like seven years ago, mm -hmm. you know, when it was just, you know, an idea and, and you know, interviewed me for the, for the film and some like, you know, on some highway in Santa Rosa or something in this noisy, like a little, whatever, you know, like a little camcordery kind of thing in a hotel. Um, and it was just an idea, but you can't say no to any opportunity. Right. So like poor Dean Orn is still kicking himself for not being in forks over knives because he was taking some time off or whatever. So you just got to be in everything and hope something helps. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, so then he actually, um, started to get some momentum for the film and uh, and invited me back. Said, "Sorry, we got to throw all that footage away. It was crappy footage, but now we actually have real cameras." And you know, all right, right. So then we, you know, do another thing, and that actually happened once or twice more. Then they're like, "Okay, now we really have money. Now we have like the fancy." So I went through like, and then of course I get cut out completely from the film, which is mm -hmm. fine. I wouldn't replace a second of it. For, um, I think it's so perfect. Um, uh, but hopefully I'll be in some DVD extra or something, uh, down the road. But, um, so, but the role I could play instead was to fact check the film uh -huh. because I, mean, I have an army. I mean, th yeah. that, that's what we do. You're the perfect person for that. Yeah. Yeah, role. yeah. And, and, and we actually behind the scene and, and, uh, open invitation to anyone writing a book, um, producing a film, TV show, anything, come to me, I'll do it for free. Our whole team, I mean, it's so important to me that we don't say ridiculous stuff and people throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, the movement has said just ridiculous, crazy stuff, exaggerated stuff. I mean, why? I mean, if, if, yeah, it doesn't help the movement to do that. Right. And because and, it, it, it imperils the credibility. And if you have, and uh, as if we have to exaggerate anything, I mean, we should use the industry estimates for everything. Mm -hmm. The most low ball, you know, oh, oh yeah, it's only 1,500 gallons per pound of beef, whatever water, you know, according to the National Academy's Beef Association or whatever. I mean, that's what, I mean, 
I, yeah, it, it boggles the mind. So yeah, that's so critical. That so a lot of the books that that you know I are written up, and as long as as long and we will do it as long as they're willing to actually right. So your your job was really it. vetting all the science so yeah. that there was no exaggerations and that everything yeah, that yeah. was said and every scene kind of you know met the met the and, scientific and, muster. In fact, was conservative. Criticism. So not just. Sticking to the consensus, but like on the conservative side of anything, let's not see anything. The science is so strong. We don't need to exaggerate. We don't need to go anywhere but beyond the you know, solid ground we're standing Right. On. And the, uh, the whole erectile dysfunction <laughs> sequence was your brainchild. I right? was. I, <laughs> so walk us through that. Uh, well, so uh, we need. So I had the data. I had the science. But again, you need to make the science relatable. You know, I could show, you know, a, a graph, a table, an amazing table with a statistical significance that alone would give you an erection. But that's that's not going to move a visual that's audience. That's not cinematic. It's not cinematic. Yeah. And so they kept asking me, how do we make it? How do we make it visual? How do we make it alive? And so, so I said, well, let's do the lactestins, the you know, the the, the cloudiness of the fat after eating a meal in the in the serum. And I knew just from reading the the literature on uh, on uh, on uh, blood flow on endothelial function that they had these Rigiscan machines with a name like Rigiscan. Mm -hmm. It's got to be good. Um, <laughs> and yeah. and so and so and now it's actually being done um, legit. I mean, in a in a real study. In fact, I think um, by Osfeld. Um, oh, Dr. Wow. Osfeld mm -hmm. is now has the funding. He's actually going to put it to the test in a really, you know, tightly controlled, randomized fashion with a, you know, a, a cadre of folks. Right. But it, again, it was just they wanted to show the example to, you know, anyway. Right. Yeah. But so latest book, How Not to Diet. How dare you write a book about weight loss? <laughs> I can't believe this. Right. So How Not to Diet is really about sort of tackling, preventing, reversing the, you know, the the sort of top ailments, chronic ailments that people suffer from. But of course, obesity is an ailment in and of itself or a contributor to a variety of ailments, right? So without sort of confronting obesity head on, um, you're not really getting, you know, you're, you're not going to move the needle for people, right? So you got you to yeah. get them to lose weight. Right? So I did the, yeah, yeah. So how not to die, 15 leading causes of death. Just went right. through one through 15 chapter on each, talking about the world, die, make plan, preventing, resting, reversing. So there's a type 2 diabetes chapter, obviously, the, but, but never took obesity on directly. Um, and, uh, and it really required its own thing. Uh -huh. And so that, I mean, yeah. Ugh. So you have to then turn your focus into how to help people lose weight, right? Like what is the science of weight loss? And I would imagine, you know, you had to de you confront like a lot of things that we sort of assume or take for granted that perhaps maybe didn't turn out to be true. Like, like, oh, calorie in, calorie out, or, you know, three meals a day or what, you know, what are, there's so much conventional wisdom around like, here's how you lose weight, ABC. So, by immersing yourself in all of this research, like what surprised you the most or what did you discover that perhaps, you know, you didn't expect? Yeah. So in both ways, some of the conventional wisdom actually has a real scientific basis and only recently does it have a real scientific basis. So for years, we've just been saying, talking out of our butt, but now, oh, that's actually uh -huh. true. We should, you know, breakfast like a king, you know, lunch like a prince, dinner like a pauper kind of thing. Um, some of this, or, you know, drink water before a meal, very common kind of mm -hmm. thing. Oh, now we actually have science. It really does um, show beneficial effects. But I think the biggest... Uh, the biggest challenge for me, just because this is not my field. I mean, I, you know, I just know from what I learned in med school um, and this concept that a calorie is a calorie, right? A calorie from one source is just as fattening as a calorie from any other source. I mean, this is kind of a trope broadcast by the food industry to kind of absolve itself of culpability, but it's just not true. Like, a, you know, 100 calories of chickpeas has a different effect on body weight than 100 calories of chicken or chiclets based on absorption, based on fiber content, based on all sorts. And even if you absorb the same amount, even a calorie may still not be a calorie. It depends when you eat it, in what context you eat it, how fast you eat it. All so I mean, so I mean, that just kind of exploded like uh, my concepts of mm -hmm. 
kind of what we had learned in, in, in med school. So like this chronobiology, I have a whole chapter on the right. whole circadian Walk us rhythm. through this, because this is, I had never heard anything Correct. about this. Well, so what I had known, um, what we learned about in, me, in, in medical training is what's called chronotherapeutics, where if you give chemotherapy at the right time of day, you actually have fewer side effects, and it's more effective than giving it at a different time of day. Same dose, same drug, um, which uh, which is fascinating. Um, but I hadn't taken it the, to the logical conclusion. What about uh, chrono prevention? Might exercise and 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 you know uh, sleep patterns and meal patterns also play a role if it has such a dramatic effect? And indeed, calories eaten in the morning are less fattening than the exact same food eaten at night. Fewer calories after sundown, the better. So they do these studies. How the exact is it? Why same is snacks. that? Well, it's because, um, so for example, uh, uh, in the morning, your bo body has to, uh, to make glycogen stores for the, for the rest of the day. And in make, instead of just using the energy, um, if, you, uh, if you take the little uh, chains of sugars and starches and, and make them to glycogen in your muscles and liver, um, that's an energy intensive process. And then you break it back down to be used later on. And so the fact that you're using energy to basically get the energy right back is kind of energy intensive process. Mm -hmm. That's one of the small reasons why um, eating in the morning when, you're, when your body you know, knows it's got a whole day ahead of it, um, uh, where you, you, know, you have that, uh, that glycogen building signal earlier in the day. Um, but you know, a lot of the chronobiology stuff we just don't know. Um, in terms of what exactly is going on, but everything from body temperature to, uh, you know, testosterone to cortisol levels, everything, um, you know, goes on this, this, this wild daily cycle. And then there's seasonal cycles, weight loss, you know, it's the, 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 the weight you put on in the kind of winter months for, for the, for the right. holidays it may have Depends a role. Depends upon to how far the earth is from the sun. It's crazy, right? The, the, <laughs> yeah. the rotation. Uh -huh. Um, so that was, I mean, that, 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 yeah, that just blew me away. So you can put people on 2000 calories, the exact same 2000 calories as one meal at breakfast or one meal at supper. The army did this. Um, and one, and, uh, the evening group, same calories gains weight and the, um, breakfast uh, group loses weight. That's I mean, such it's, a trip. It's crazy. Um, and so then that really opened my eyes. Like, okay, well now anything's possible. And so then really kind of dug deep and, you know, came up just, you know, what are the criteria for, uh, for optimum weight loss? Like what would, a what would the optimum weight loss diet look like from kind of from the ground up just because, um, Originally, how not to diet. It was going to be a chapter on each of the latest diet trends um, and just, you know, going through what's the science behind each. But I realized the book's going to be out of date before it even comes out. You know, mm -hmm. I'm part of the U.S. News and World Report, you know, diet panel, you know, and right. so we get dozens of new diets I've never heard about every year that we have to go through. Um, and I just realized, well, wait a second. This, that's not the – right. It's like whack-a-mole. Right. So instead, let's just – here's the criteria against which you can look at any future diet – um, and see kind of where it would fall among this range. Um, and then, um, and then the second half of the book is regardless of what you eat, there are, you know, kind of tips and tricks that can, and, and tweaks that can get you to accelerate. Right. Like the water effect. thing and the focusing thing, on right. nutritional density and caloric dilution, things so, like that. So uh, yeah, nutritional density, that's really the first part. I mean, that's part of a good health, uh -huh. a weight loss diet. It's a w weight loss techniques, but like the water, right? Water preloading. So if you drink two cups of water before eating a Whopper, you'll gain less weight than, I mean, so, I mean, so it's regardless of what you eat. That's mm. the whole second half. And the hope is people won't just kind of jump to the second half and they'll actually do a safe, sustainable, right. nutritious, healthy mm -hmm. diet. But um, in terms of the foods to eat, though, I mean, it harkens back to the previous book and it kind of orients around the daily dozen. Uh, it ended up, <laughs> I yeah. mean, it ended up that way um, based on those criteria. Like you want to be fiber rich and, you know, low in added sugars and low in added fat and, you know, uh, you know, uh, water rich and all these things. And the same, you know, vegetables and kind of on down the list. And that was the that was the the you know, the criticism we got from the daily diet you know, the daily dozen app that we released. Um, it's you know had a million downloads, and there's two camps of criticism. One is oh my god, it's too much food. I can't eat it all. Uh -huh. um, in which case, too I'm like, much look, food. Too much. Oh my god, I can't go through you, all this you stuff. Make sure you get all of that. In well, the day. That, I mean, that, but the I said, look, it's aspirational. Like yeah. you know, it's just and you can you know make a game and see how many you can get. And if you don't do good one day, you can try better the next day. And that was actually this. I mean, I'm hoping to you know after you checked off those boxes, there's only so much room for pepperoni pizza at the end of the day. I mean, it's it's this kind of. <laughs> 
it's this kind of eat uh-huh. more approach, but it's really hoping to kind of push out some of the less right. healthy options. But the other group of criticisms came in and says, not enough calories. It's like, look, I'm training. There's no way I'm getting, a, getting enough calories eating this kind of stuff. I was like, well, look, this is the minimum. You can eat more food. I'm not mm-hmm. saying this is all you can eat. This is, I, I just want people to hit this. But then I realized, well, wait a second. Oh, too much food, too few calories. That sounds like a good weight loss diet. And the fact that these are some of the healthiest foods on the planet is a good bonus as well. Right. Did you come across uh, some interesting research on intermittent fasting? Because that seems to be the thing that, that you know, a lot of people are talking about and thinking about and practicing right now. And I've had a couple of people on the podcast speak to it. That's the biggest chapter is the fasting chapter. Yeah. So much information. Now, I remember looking to fasting because it's been a, a you know common interest for for years. People ask me about it. And anytime, I only want to say I don't know once ever, even if it's the most esoteric question in the world, I want to, the next time someone asks me that, I'm going to know an answer to it. And so people can ask me about fasting and there just was no data. Um, and so that's why if there's, if there's, if there's a condition or food that you can't find on nutritionfacts.org, the number one reason is probably because there's just no good data out there. I mean, it's not like, you know, I'm trying to ignore it. It's just like, we don't know. Uh-huh. Um, and so, but that, just in the last few years, there's been an explosion of research into intermittent fasting, water-only fasting, you know, 5-2, 25-5, time-restricted feeding, all these. Um, uh, and so, tremendous literature. And what was interesting about the intermittent fasting literature, well, so in terms of intermittent fasting, no benefit in terms of uh, compliance or, or lean mass conservation or weight loss compared to continuous caloric restriction. Uh, and the longest, largest studies to date shows uh, increasing cholesterol um, for people that mm-hmm. have the same caloric restriction uh, doing alternate day uh, modified fasting. And so I would encourage people not to do it or at least uh, get their cholesterol um, checked. Um, but the time-restricted feeding where you try to narrow your eating window to 12 hours or less, um, and so you're fasting at least half the day. What, what was that's, This was one of the research areas where there was diametrically opposed. Some studies show it's great for you. Other studies show it's terrible for you. It has all these negative metabolic consequences. And so it was my job to like, what is going on here? And it turns out it's timing early versus late. So when do you break the fast? So your your window, right? So if your window is late, you get the negative biological consequence of eating at night um, and, and, and shifting your calories towards later in the day. And so people that skip breakfast had these negative metabolic effects of time restricted feeding. Whereas people that did early time restricted feeding not only got the ben- the chronobiological benefits of shifting their calories towards the beginning of the day, they also got the time restricted feeding benefits. Um, and so that is really the I mean, that that that's that's one of the things in the book that actually changed the way my family eats. Yeah, you just rocked me with that. Because I do it where I eat at night, if you're good, and I if, don't eat during mi- the day. If you miss any meal, it should be uh, it should be you, supper, not breakfast. Right, breakfast Absolutely. is called break fast for a reason. Yeah, I mean that. And, and, and wow, yeah, I mean, uh, and and, the, and and that actually may be one of the reasons that the Seven Day Adventist vegetarians live the longest living population in the world. Right, Okinawa Japanese was the number two, and they're not, they now they're eating KFC. There's really only one blue zone that continues to this day. It's in Loma Linda, California. The Seven Day Adventist vegetarians, longest living, formerly stopped studied population in the world, but it may. But one of the reasons may be because they practice this early time restricted feeding, often skipping supper. The the teachings of the church are, you know, like two meals a day mm-hmm. and, um, you know, make lunch the biggest meal of the day. Um, it hasn't been put to the test, but uh, given all this uh, short-term data. Yeah, that's, that's super uh, interesting. That may be, uh, I don't know. That'll be the next book, How Not to Age. I'll look deep into that. Is it? Is that the next? It that's is? It. That uh, should starting, be, wow. uh, yeah, uh, January 2021. Wow. It'll be out December 22. Oh my God. What's the book after that? Um, um, I think it's going to be uh, How Not to Die from Cancer for Cancer Survivors. Mm. Um, unfortunately, you know, the advice uh, people with cancer diagnosis get is eat whatever you want or just keep weight on or whatever. Terrible advice. Um, and now we actually have some decent data on cancer survival, not just prevent. I mean, so how not to die, how to prevent cancer. Yeah. What if you already have cancer? What can we do to slow down, stop, reverse? So that'll, that'll probably right. be next. And then we're, um, I'm going to do uh, um, one on mental health after right. that. How not to age, though. That's a, that's a good one. I just had 
uh, David Sinclair in here the oh, other day. Oh, great, great, fantastic. Um, I got Dan Butner coming back here tomorrow. Oh, nice. So I'm all about the oh, longevity, big hug for me. <laughs> the aging stuff. That's super interesting. I mean, I think the work that David is doing, obviously that's in the genetic field. It's not nutrition per se, but I think there's so much emerging science that's happening right mm. there. It's pretty fascinating. You know, in fact, there was this one seminal paper that really inspired me to write the whole book. And that was basically the big pharma got together the top researchers in the world, flew them to the, some luxury resort somewhere. And so Sinclair was there and Walter mm. Longo and everybody who's anyone in the field got paid enough money to all come together to list the most, uh, potentially uh, the, 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 the most druggable um, longevity pathways in the body. Like if we wanted to make a, you know, a longevity drug, how would we do it? Right. So they all sat down. They came up with these five biochemical pathways for longevity. And I looked at these. I said, wait a second. Every single one of these we can modify with diet. You know, so we're talking about like mTOR and IGF-1 and all the, wait a second, the, we could all do, you know, so I was like, oh, it's like, per, that's the whole book, like one chapter on each, we can, yeah, I'm so I'm really excited about wow, that's digging cool. in. Yeah, very cool. So I imagine you probably get this from time to time, Dr. Greger, uh, love the new book, um, but I got to tell you, I've been on the keto diet, I've lost all this weight, I feel good, or I'm on the carnivore diet, I'm on this diet, I'm on that right. diet, so... Uh, you know, like you can't tell me that your way is better than my way. Right. And I mean, I can say, let's see your lab work or let me see your arteries. Let me see your calcium score. Let me see. I mean, you know, Blood work doesn't mean way. anything. That's the, that's a sort of common retort from the low carb carnivore camp that these, the blood work is misleading because it doesn't necessarily mean what it says. Uh, well, I mean, if you have science to support that, but that's not what the, I mean, the science shows, I mean, I, I mean, so, you know, there's, you know, the presidential advisory from the American Heart Association came out, you know, for it to, because of these crazy myths out there that they have to write these papers saying, yes, saturated fat is bad for you. Yes, coconut oil is bad for you. Um, uh, and I mean, and, and yes, LDL is, is a leading predictor of heart disease. I mean, you know, I mean. Things that have been settled science for decades, but in the internet age of flat earthers, we have to come out and, and explicitly, uh, explicitly say. Right. And so, I mean, yeah. So, uh, and, and, and we don't just have, you know, short-term biomarkers. We have, you know, large populations of people who follow diets, even, even trending in that direction, um, uh, living significantly shorter lives. It is interesting that the carnivore diet has has caught the attention of so many people and seems to be like a, like a trending thing right now. It's, just, it's like a, yeah, it's, it's like a, it's like if an internet troll were a diet, it would be the, <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, it's just like the, right? Um, but I mean, look, you can imagine someone with food intolerance, whether it's celiac disease or anything, Right, it's um, the ultimate basically, elimination it's diet. It's an elimination diet, right? Yeah. And so people go on elimination diets. I mean, typically you put someone on like, you know, water, sweet potatoes, and tapioca, like three things no one's allergic to. And then all of a sudden their joints feel better. They have more energy. All of a sudden their chronic indigestion goes away. Okay. And then you add back, what was it? What was it about your diet that, you know, was causing a problem? Um, and so and it's the same thing. I mean, you're just basically, you know, excluding. Um, and so if you did have some kind of intolerance, well then, you know, but obviously – then you'd want to add healthy foods back into your diet to find out what it is. And so you can actually yeah. have a, live a long, healthy life. One of the things that I've been contending with in the last couple of years, I mean, I've been plant-based for 13 years now, is the fact that now there is this proliferation of amazing taste, mm. tasting plant-based analogs to every food imaginable, right? And it all tastes great. And I'll find myself indulging in that a little bit more than I should and kind of, you know, selling the lie to myself like, oh, it's, it's plant-based. It's cool. You know, and, and knowing, of course, like, this isn't the healthiest thing. This is, this is not Dr. <laughs> Greger's daily dozen, you know, <laughs> right, and, right. Then, and then I follow that up with, with another kind of layer of denial, which is that because I'm an athlete that I can kind of outrun it, burn you it know, off, I can right. burn it off. Yeah. And as long as I'm trim and I feel good, mm. yeah, that yeah, yeah. that um, I'm not I'm not necessarily paying the same toll that mm. somebody mm. else is. And I know yeah, that's yeah. not true. And and so there's always like 
yeah, I'm plant based, but I can there's I can certainly iterate and evolve, yeah, yeah. you know, to do better than than I'm yeah. doing. Yeah, yeah. No, and that and, right, it's a process and it's harder. I mean, but I mean what I see, you know, when I see an ad from Burger King bragging that it's 100% Whopper, 0% beef. They're bragging that there's no beef in their new burger. I mean, that just speaks to me to the tremendous surge in interest in plant-based eating. Of course. It's I mean, so I'm like, not, I don't so mean to be... Right. No, yeah. So, that, I mean, so but when just, I say, right, but nutritionally, right, if you look at these things, often more sodium, usually coconut oil based, so may have as much or more saturated fat even sometimes. Um, so these are, right, not healthy foods, step in the right direction, stepping stone foods, I like to mm-hmm. call them. You know, um, uh, you know, not everyone could go, you know, kale quinoa overnight, um, but uh, transition foods to get people um, uh, in the direction of eating healthier. So I see it as a tremendously kind of optimistic social phenomenon, but my concern is that people will stop there. People will... Uh, you just kind of switch over their milkshakes, their cheeseburgers and milkshakes, mm-hmm. um, and then stall there and not capture the full benefits of uh, of uh, plant based eating. Yeah, it's never been easier to 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 eat. Vegan. You can go, you can get your, you can go to Burger King and get get fries and a burger, and you can oh, yeah. then go get coconut ice cream and knock yourself out, and then yeah. wonder. How come I'm not losing weight? How come right, I'm getting yeah, fatter? Yeah, yeah. I just yeah, I moved to Philly recently. There are multiple all vegan donut shops. Like, oh, which all vegan donut shop yeah. do you want to go? You know, I mean, I mean that's uh, right. right. And so right, I mean you can be you can have a terrible, terrible um, vegan diet. I know that if I'm eating whole food, plant based, and I'm adhering to that pretty strictly, that I don't really have to like the idea of needing to diet. I, it just no, doesn't, right, it just, right. I don't have to worry about right, it. Right. right? So right. how not you, to diet, how not, I know that's tricky, right? <laughs> how to diet, not as Yoda would say, would have retitled it. Um, so knowing that then it is now, it is how not to diet. And yet it is a program that extends beyond just eat these foods. Like you have these strategies and things to kind of accelerate that aspect mm-hmm. of it. Right. And, and because I wanted to, I mean, with so much kind of nutritional noise and nonsense out there, I just wanted there to finally be not only an evidence-based diet book, but, you know, I cite you know, thousands of studies digging up every possible, you know, tip, trick, tweak, technique proven to accelerate the loss of body fat, to give people every possible advantage and kind of, you know, build them an optimal weight loss solution from the ground up. Basically, my criteria is if, I mean, if it's been proven to, to cause weight loss and it's not... I mean, I had a low bar, but like I don't have a chapter on which cigarettes are best to smoke. I mean, we, and we know nicotine yeah. is uh, is I mean a proven, uh, you know. But so I say, look, we can eat nicotine containing foods and maybe get uh, some of benefits. But um, and there was some some things I actually cut out. Like there was a licorice root chapter I took out because the therapeutic index of you could get too much licorice really easily and hurt yourself. Um, but so there were some things. There was some base level of safety, but beyond that. If it caused weight loss in a randomized control trial, it's in the book, and I want to give people every mm-hmm. possible kind of advantage. And so that's where I came this kind of 21 tweaks thing to add on to their daily dozen now. They've got like 40 check marks every day, you know, if you really wanted to go all out. So if somebody comes to you and says, listen, I'm 50, 60 pounds overweight, I got I to gotta drop this weight, my life hangs in the balance, like how do you kickstart that person? Like walk me through, like if you had – you know, five or 10 minutes to speak to this person, how do you kind of get them sorted and on their way? Yeah. So get them the right information, right? I mean, so, yeah. So, uh, you know, I could uh, share them the app, Dr. Greer's Daily Dozen free app. Obviously everything I do, um, everything I uh, produce is available free. Um, and then, you know, tell them about something like 21 Day Kickstart Program from mm-hmm. PCRM, right? Physicians yeah. Committee for Responsible Medicine, first of every month, it's totally free, bunch of different languages, hundreds of thousands of people have done it. You do it as kind of a social media group together and, you know, you get daily advice and tips and things like that. Again, just to stick with it long enough so you can see the benefits yourself. And then it's no longer some doctor wagging their finger at you, but you have that internal motivation to stick with it because you feel so much better, your digestion is better, your sleep's better, your energy is better. Oh, and you're losing weight and, you know, without thinking about it. What are some of the crazier turnaround stories that you've heard or experienced. Oh, well, I mean, what, I mean, the, the most exciting things is diseases for which there's nothing in the literature that suggests it's possible. So people come to me and say, I have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, um, hypothyroidism, and I tell them you're going to be on thyroid hormone replacement the rest of your life. Your thyroid's all scarred up. It's over. Um, and we can help prevent it. 
Um, but, you know, and they say, no, no, I had it. I was diagnosed. I was on this for years. And then I went plant-based and all of a sudden I'm off my thyroid medication. Here's my TSH. Here's my lab values. Um, and I tell them, your doctor has to write you up as a case study. I want to see this published and I'll do a video about it. I mean, so, you know, someone yeah. comes to me with ankylosing spondylitis or some, one of these, you know, uh, horrible inflammatory autoimmune diseases. I'm like, look, we have great data on Crohn's and, and multiple sclerosis and, um, yeah, and, and uh, ulcerative colitis and other similar rheumatoid arthritis, similar inflammatory. I'm not surprised it helps with your disease, but there hasn't been anything published yet. And so quick, we got to get you, we, we, got, we have to, you know, it doesn't exist in the scientific world, unless it's published in peer-reviewed uh, scientific literature. And so I encourage them to get it out there. And actually, there was just a case series on ankylosing spondylitis, I'm excited to say. Oh, but wow. I mean, those, those I mean, you expect that you, you, I no longer have diabetes, I no longer have heart disease, I mean, all these things. And, you know, teary-eyed and, you know, I mean, it's, you know, they're out of their wheelchair, they're walking again, it's, they have their lives back, and they have a future again. That, you know, Old hat. That's what I've been seeing for years. But what some of these new, you know, where someone says, you know, I have some, you know, some d disease I have to look up um, and help with that, too. And he said, wait a second. It's a little snake oily panacea. Right. I mean, that's just, that's a red flag when yeah. someone says my thing can help with X, Y and Z. But you realize, look, we're talking about a diet that improves arterial health. Every single one of our organs needs blood flow to get rid of waste products, get oxygen, nutrients. And so the, no wonder that a heart-healthy diet is a brain-healthy diet, is a liver-healthy diet, is a kidney-healthy diet, right? And a plant-based diet is, a whole food plant-based diet is basically synonymous with an anti-inflammatory diet. And since inflammation plays a role in so many chronic diseases, no wonder an anti-inflammatory diet is going to help kind of across the board with all these things. And so, I mean, there's these kind of underlying, uh, you know, mechanisms by which you, know, you can imagine. And look, even someone will ask me, uh, what does it work for a disease, you know, Z that, you know, and I say, well, I don't know, but a healthy diet can only help, right? I mean, mm -hmm. look, uh, probably people with d disease D, Z probably still die of heart disease, number one, right? So for, for example, uh, breast cancer, uh, postmenopausal breast cancer, number one killer of women with older women with breast cancer, heart disease, still kills them more wow. than breast cancer. And so, whether or not a whole food plant-based diet reverses breast cancer, you're, st you're still more likely to die from heart disease. And we know we can reverse heart disease. So, of course, everyone with breast cancer, of course, everyone, should be on this healthy diet. Um, and then if there's side benefits, well, then great. I mean, you know, as we've seen with prostate cancer and some other conditions. Well, when you look at, yeah, like what you, like what you said, I mean, what's killing people? Heart disease, stroke, obesity, you know, in terms of brain health, Alzheimer's is exploding yeah. right now. Yeah. And to the extent that you're eating in a way that's improving arterial function and reducing inflammation, right? the downstream domino impact of right. that, you know, has all kinds of positive consequences. Even if it doesn't help, it helps, right? <laughs> right? Even yeah. if it doesn't help that particular thing, it, I mean, that's right? That's like that meme of uh, what if it turned out that 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 uh, global warming is a hoax? We just improve the planet for no reason, you know? <laughs> there we go, right, <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, like, well, does stopping smoking help this disease? I don't know, but it's probably a good idea <laughs> yeah. to stop smoking, right? I mean, uh -huh. it's just, I mean, it's just kind of, yeah. What is a day in your personal life with food? Like, how do you make it work? Well, about. on the right, well, again, the, uh, my travel years, yeah, travel years are real tough. And how do you deal with the airports you know, yeah, and all of that? Yeah, airport food courts. Yeah, well, look, it's getting easier. Now you can get like brown rice in an airport. I mean, that's mm. great. Like these, like, you know, fast casual places, like, I, you know, things you never expect to see before. And look, there's, you know, I've, I've grown better, you know, if I can, you know, land someplace and find a Whole Foods and have a hot bar and I can grab some food and, you know, first few days I have snacks and then slowly it's all gone. You know what I've been doing recently is... I, we tell the organizers, you got to bring me food. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's only so many microwaves. Put it in the rider. There's only so many sweet potatoes oh, I can Gregor. get on my plane. He's the guy with the crazy rider. Right, right, right. right. Who does he think not he is, only, Van Halen? Not only no green no. M&Ms, no M&Ms, period. <laughs> yeah. It's all. Right. Um, and so, right. And so, look, I, you know, I need to, I, yeah. Mm -hmm. And typically, I don't even have time. Even if I could, I mean... Right. Even if there's healthy food around, here I am, Southern California, I could get healthy food, but I don't have time. I mean, it's just- And on the rare days that you're at home. Oh, now then, once I have control over my life- I love life, how excited you are. And no, that's a beautiful thing. <laughs> I, well, I mean, I just, yeah, this is my first day of this this few week stint. Uh -huh. And so I'm, I'm feeling the, the, the leaving home thing. It was, it was, it was hard to, to get up this morning. But 
Um, yeah, then I can eat this beautiful diet. Oh my, and it's like, it's, it's like a, it, it's like a, it's like a game. Like how healthy can I get? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really, um, and, uh, and you know what helped? So I do a lot of food delivery, like whole foods delivery. Mm -hmm. And then, then you're not even tempted to buy junk because it's not in front of you. Grab And so it's like everything I eat. So my house just has healthy food. And so if you get hungry enough, you're going to eat an apple, right? I mean, there's nothing, you will eventually eat that apple, right? And so with only healthy stuff. You know, I can I can build up my my healthy immune system. Always making that healthy the choice the, uh, the the most convenient. Right. Oh yeah, I could go out in the in the in the Philadelphia winter and bike someplace to get something <laughs> to bike to the donut shop. But mm -hmm. so much easier when I have a fridge full of yummy food. And do you prepare stuff ahead of time? Uh, I do a lot of batch cooking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, particularly now, I'm doing a lot of this this prebiotic mix. I talked about my uh, when I, in studying the improving your uh, uh, microbiome for the new big uh -huh. microbiome chapter in the in the diet book, um, and just learning how again how important microbiome is and where the most concentrated source of prebiotics. And so I I, I discovered sorghum for the first time. I discovered all these weird millets that I had no idea that have poorly digested starch, and so they are fed to animals. But poorly digested starch is exactly what we want because mm -hmm. it's poorly digested in our small intestine, makes it down to our lower intestine where our good gut bugs can have a bounty of prebiotics and then has all those knock-on benefits. And so that's the kind of thing where I just instant pot a huge amount and just, you know, Tupperware in the fridge um, and, you know, take out one every day since it's over. And, you know, so I always have... Uh, always have my intact grains and a whole bunch of wonderful black lentils. And then it's a matter of just getting greens in the house. What else did you learn about the gut, uh, the gut biome in, in prepping for this? What's book? neat is now we have these interventional trials. So we've always known you, uh, you can, uh, so flashback a few years ago, it was a black hole, almost no pun intended where, because most gut bugs are actually unculturable in laboratory conditions. Like we can't grow them outside of the human colon. We don't know what the gas. We don't mm -hmm. know, and so it, we had, it was black bite. We had no idea what was going on there until we had genetic fingerprinting techniques, and all of a sudden, for the first time, we'd be like, "Oh, okay, we can actually track people's microbiome over time, compare people's different microbiomes, and we can correlate diseases with um, uh, with different uh, bugs in our gut, and change people's diets, change the microbiome, see the beneficial or adverse effects, but." That's the problem. If you improve someone's diet, all of a sudden you give people lots of whole grains and legumes, uh, beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils, lots of prebiotics. They get these beneficial changes in their microbiome, and all of a sudden they have amazing health benefits. Uh, yeah, but you just fed them a whole bunch of healthy food. How do we know microbiome has anything to do with it? That's where fecal transplants come along, uh -huh. right? Then we can prove it's the microbiome because we can take those gut bugs and put it into somebody who's continuously the crappy diet. And see if we can get those same metabolic benefits. And that's what we're seeing. And so we're seeing, um, yeah, so, you know, someone gets a fecal transplant for someone who's overweight, all of a sudden they start packing on pounds eating the same food. Um, or there's that's crazy mental health changes, um, all sorts of crazy things. Um, and, and then we can prove it's the gut bug. Now, what happens is, of course, it's temporary because, right, you, you infuse the gut bugs, yeah, but then you keep starving it. them by not eating any fiber and then they die away. But you see initially those same benefits. Of course, you got to feed those gut, gut bugs or they're going to mm -hmm. die off. But, but so, so what went from a, from a correlation science, now we have a causation science. Um, and it's just fascinating that we can transfer the benefits of healthy diet. So, so, so I mean, so the, the black market rich roll stool, you could, I mean, you know, the, 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 right. the, I mean, yeah. Start selling that shit. I, I, exactly. <laughs> right? I mean, who wouldn't pay? It is, it is fascinating. I mean, the links to cravings as well, like oh, the, yeah. the nature Amazing. of the gut flora impacts the foods that you Immunity. crave. Uh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And. It, it also, I think, is is 
because it's so complex that it's rife for confusion and people kind of making claims about what you should and you shouldn't do that we don't necessarily have the ability to really back up at this point. It, particularly this kind of personalized nutrition. Like people all the time are sending me things. My, I, I sent my stool sample in to this company and gave me back a thing and said, I should be eating this and I shouldn't be eating this. We don't have that the kind of granularity. It does not. Same thing with the DNA testing, mm -hmm. right? People, they get back their, their genome and say, oh, well, I, you know, I'm whatever. I shouldn't be eating the X, Y, and Z. We don't have that kind of. Um, uh, but is it true we should be eating fermented foods and we should be eating, you know, nutritionally a variety of nutritionally dense foods to be kind of seeding that that gut flora with a diversity of 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 bacteria? So it's the three, right? So it's prebiotics, probiotics, and polyphenols, uh -huh. which are these kind of tend to be brightly colored pigments in fruits and vegetables. These are kind of the three uh, the three things that, that benefit a good mi a microbiome, and you can use all three of them or just two of them. I mean, the problem with probiotics is you take them and then they just die off. You don't continue to eat healthy. And so if you just have like antibiotic associated diarrhea or something, you, you wipe out your gut, uh -huh. gut bugs, then I see a therapeutic role of something like probiotics. But otherwise, taking probiotics is useless because they'll just die off. If you put them in the same environment that didn't grow good gut bugs in the first place, putting in some good acidophilus, they're just going to die off because you're not feeding the acidophilus because good gut bugs are by definition fiber feeders, resistant starch eaters. These are, I mean, that's that's, that, that's what makes good gut bugs grow. Um, and so what we really need is we just need to feed our good gut bugs prebiotics. And people are like, oh, I eat so many fruits and vegetables. But you must realize fruits and vegetables are almost all water. Like, you know, uh, fruits are like 80% water. Or some water-rich vegetables, 90 95% water. They're water in vegetable form. Not actually a lot of fiber. You can actually have a pretty deficient Fiber deficient diet, if you're not including whole grains and legumes, some of these drier mm. um, uh, foods um, into your daily diet. Wow. Um, that's good to know. Because I, I just thought, well, as long as I'm eating a lot of high fiber foods, like right. I'm, I'm basically taking care of my prebiotic needs. All right. But there, it's actually not. So the uh, fruits and vegetables are not high. I mean, they're high fiber foods compared to what 99% of the population eats. But um, if you're really trying to build, you know, 70 grams a day, uh, you know, 80 grams a day, or like 120 grams, which is how we probably evolved, you know, based on human coprolites, you know, fossilized feces, um, then, I mean, if you, and you do the math, you, people don't even close. So, you know, Ornish, you know, really healthy, you know, uh, um, whole food plant-based diet, you got to like 60, um, mm -hmm. Which is, you know, average is about 15, uh, recommended minimums about 30. And so getting 60, but I mean, that's, I mean, that's a remarkably healthy diet to shoot up there. And then these population studies where they have no, essentially no heart disease, no diabetes, no breast cancer, no, you know, like sub Saharan Africa, um, um uh, half century ago, <laughs> they were getting, you know, the, the triple digit fiber uh, consumption right. every day. And so part of that benefit may actually have been the microbiome. Um, uh, and that, that was the benefit of the, of the fiber as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, dropping one's cholesterol or something. Right. More will be revealed though. I think there's, there, there's, there's gotta be like lots of crazy studies being performed right now. Oh, on, fascinating. On no. And so there, there are vegan fecal transplant studies. What can yeah. we, will you give someone a, you know, you know, uh, you know, they do it through tubes, they uh -huh. do it through capsules. I, you know, you just don't want to burp after that, you know, that kind of thing. Do you know, but, uh, Robin Shutkan, Dr. Robin Shutkan, mm -hmm. um, she's a DC, uh, DC, um, physician who specializes in, in the microbiome. And she cool. was, she was on the show a long time ago, but she was predicting not only fecal transplants becoming like a booming business, but actual spas, like high end spas where you could go and, and have your, and you know, pick, your pick artisanal your... <laughs> fecal transplants. Right, right. You know? What you want them to eat for the week before you show <laughs> yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. I want that right. That's I funny. Know. Oh, that's great. Well, let's, let's shift gears. I want to talk about um, sitting for a minute because mm. you did some interesting mm. stuff here in the book around that. I know you're, we're sitting oh, yeah, now, yeah, 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 but yeah. sitting yeah, yeah. Is, is, unless you're on an airplane or in a, uh, in yeah. a car. Yeah. Yeah. I'm stuck. Yeah. Stuck in my butt all day in a plane typically. Um, but, uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, I, there, there's this myth that sitting is new smoking, not by any stretch mm. of the imagination, at least 10 times more, um, deadly to smoke than to sit, but prolonged sitting, um, defined typically over six hours a day is associated with increased mortality. Even if you then go out to the gym and work out hard for an hour a day after work. And so it does, I mean, and th that helps, but doesn't completely counterbalance the fact that you're sitting all day. And we think a lot of that has to do with the uh, venous stasis 
um, uh, the, 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 the coagulability coagulability of your blood, the fact that you're not actually having movement of blood through mm -hmm. your um, uh, veins in your lower legs um, uh, affects endothelial function and affects kind of uh, your kind of systemic arterial tree. But even something like, you know, bobbing your knee up and down um, uh, has been shown to completely uh, uh, eliminate those effects. That's wild. Um, and so, and they, and they have someone just bob one knee up and down versus uh -huh. the other, and you can measure the differences um, <laughs> in what's going on in their legs. And that is what's correlated with this um, increased, uh, you know, cardiovascular disease, mm -hmm. uh, morbidity and mortality. So there's a way, so even if you're a truck driver, even if you're stuck inside all day, sitting down, there are things you can do. Um, and so, yeah, and there's all sorts of, I go through all the, the various different like little bars and things that you can put on your desk to, and which ones work, which ones are just fads. Mm. And, and so there are ways you can um, counterbalance effect, but, or you can, you know, do a standing desk, walking desk. I love getting back to my walking desk. I addicted to the thing. Wasn't if, there a study that you looked at where they put people on basically, you know, uh, a, a standardized amount of calories every day and said, you can exercise this much. And there was a difference in between, you know, some of them lost weight, some of them didn't. And it came down to how much they were sitting. And then there was this realization that there are certain people that are walking around all the time, amazing. kind of casually yeah, yeah, yeah. throughout the day. Yeah. And they were having amazing benefits that the people who were just eating the same and working out the same who were sitting more weren't able to realize. Yeah, these neat benefits, right? These non-exercise thermogenesis. Yeah, neat, so, right. so what, uh, what they, yeah. So what they realized is that um, we typically, you know, this is whole calories in calories out and you ask people what matters and people actually either say they're the same or calories out matters more. And that's completely not true. We have almost total control over calories in. In fact, we could eat nothing. Although in calories out, um, typical exercise, like casual exerciser, that's only like 5% of calories out. Um, most of our calories out are our energy intensive brains. Most wild animals, movement is their number one calories out. For us, it's our brains. We could lie down in bed, chained to a bed all day, still burn over a thousand calories. The most of the, uh, and so that's why it's, it's so mm -hmm. hard to outrun a bad diet because, you know, even a moderately exercise, moderately obese person, moderately intensely exercising for an hour burns 350 calories. I mean, most snacks, drinks, processed foods have like 70 cal are consumed at 70 calories a minute. So five minutes eating just wiped out a whole hour of exercise. That's why it's so um, difficult. But um, what they learned is because um, – and, and so there's a, there's a, you know, like a 60% slice that's just like, you know, uh, basal metabolic, you know, activity keeping your breathing, your heart pumping, your brain going – um, and then there's a, a small sliver, unless you're a mountain climber, an army ranger, or something really doing intense exercise. Um, uh, you just have a small a fraction of voluntary exercise. But then there's this non-exercise um, uh, thermogenesis, which is fidgeting, which is uh, just moving around, walking around, uh, uh, you know, standing rather than sitting. And so they, now we have these accelerometers we can put on people. And so it really revolutionized mm -hmm. our understanding of where these calories are going. Um, and why you put people on the same kind of same calorie diet, the same enforced exercise schedule, and some people lose vastly more amounts of weight than others. And most of that had to do, it's not like some people just, uh, you know, had metabolic slowing or there's some biochemical thing going on. No, it was the amount of, uh, of the, the, of, of this, 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 you know, non, uh, you know, in, you know, typical kind of exercise, you know, where you're setting out a half an hour to do any kind of exercise. It was just that they're just moving mm. around more during the day. And so how can we enforce that? Well, st being at a standing desk, you have postural muscles, otherwise you collapse to your floor. Um, you know, any, anything you can do to get you to just move yourself more and, you know, bouncing your knees, that kind of stuff. I mean, that dovetails pretty perfectly with the Blue Zones findings, right? That these people that live so long and live so healthy are people that are just kind of in constant low-grade right. motion right. throughout the day. Right. They're not going to the gym, right? Because yeah. their whole life is just, we were built to move. Um, and so, yeah, and so, I mean, that's what some of that sitting data suggests. The, what about um, the person who has struggled to lose weight their whole life and no matter what they do, they just continue to gain or they can't, you know, they stay at a certain point. Um, is there, 
is there um, validity to this being hormonal or an endocrine problem? You know, you hear people say like, oh, it's my genetic makeup or, um, you know, I just have a slow metabolism. Right. So there are some conditions. So, for example, hypothyroidism, meaning um, uh, where the, it does slow down your metabolism by about 15 percent. And indeed, it's just uh, uh, it's harder for them to lose weight. Um, but... There's no such thing as someone who's uh, basically obesity resistant. There used to be – there are people who claim no matter what, I, even if I don't eat anything, I gain weight or don't lose weight. And so scientists lock them in a lab. And when you do that, everybody, everybody, everybody – there's never been a single published case. They lose weight, in fact, exactly as they should in terms of uh, body fat. Some of them – and this is where this comes from – um, start uh, retaining water such that they lose no weight after not eating for four days. Um, and so the bathroom scale says they haven't lost a pound. But if you actually do um, CT scans, DEXA scans, actually see what's going on inside of their body, they're losing body fat exactly as predicted, but they're retaining all this water. And then finally when the diuresis happens, all of a sudden they plunge down and match exactly onto the curve. But it can take days for you to reach that. And so you can imagine people who are like, I'm starving myself for literally days, not losing a pound. There's something wrong with me. No, you are actually losing body fat every single day. It's just your scale doesn't tell you the, you know, the, 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 what compartments you're losing that weight from. Wow. That's interesting because I, I feel like that, that does come up quite a bit. People, you know, will say just, you know, I, there's something different about my genetic right. makeup that makes me immune from these positive experiences that other people have. Right. So they just have to get enough time. Yeah. One of the things that I hear quite frequently is Rich, you know, I've been listening to you. I read your book, blah, 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 whatever. I saw the movies. Um, I went plant-based for a while and now I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pretty much there, but I went back to some fish and a little bit of, you know, a little bit of meat here and there. So I'm kind of 90% in your direction. Like, is that good? Like it, how do you, how does this, how does the evidence and the science break down in terms of somebody who is predominantly plant-based? I guess the word plant-based, I mean, how do you define that? If you're right. plant-based, it doesn't mean you're, you're plant perfect or you're right. plant a hundred percent. Um, what is the difference between somebody who is, you know, adhering to, you know, your optimal protocol versus the person who is indulging in a little bit of meat and dairy products on the side. I think the body has a remarkable ability to bounce back from insults. In fact, that's what this kind of this heart disease reversal data shows um, is that you can have, you can eat a lifetime of this horrible food. And then even, I mean, the average age is like in the 60s, some of these reversal studies. Um, and even after a lifetime of that, you can clean out the areas. The body was just waiting for you to stop, mm -hmm. you know, attacking your arteries with these foods. And you could rapidly um, reversal. And you get more reversal, the more compliance you get. But but these the, the compliance wasn't perfect in most of these studies. Um, and so people were eating those kind of 90% type diets and seeing the remarkable benefits. Um, you know, it's like there's no study in the world that suggests someone with a, who's like a social smoker who picks up a few cigarettes at a party once a year is going to have any greater, you know, lung cancer risk than, than someone who doesn't mm -hmm. smoke at all. Of course, we tell people don't smoke at all because we're afraid this kind of, kind of, um, uh, you know, lead down that path. And some people are easier or ironically more compliant with strict rules, black and white rules. So if you're like, there's no cheese in the house versus a little cheese in there, I'm just going to have a little bit. Um, the concern, I think, with a lot of these uh, plant-based physicians who are like absolutely be strict, zero, you know, we don't want you to eat any of this. It's not that they think – it's not that the science supports we need that level of compliance to get the benefits, but the concern is you won't – is that you'll slip back down to your old yeah. ways. I mean, so it's a psychological – you know, uh, you know, it's easier for uh, for for an alcoholic to completely be a teetotaler than yeah. it is. To yeah, trust me. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, a couple observations on that. I mean, I certainly fall into that camp. Like, I have to have ardent, strict rules around this stuff because if I, you know, partake a little bit, that just opens the door mm -hmm. for more. Like, I just know myself well enough mm -hmm. to know, like, if hey, if I could have a little bit of cheese here and here and there. 
that I could maintain that for a little while, but six months later, there there'd probably be a lot more cheese happening. So like that would be right. That would be the, the harm. It wouldn't be that cheese once in right. a while. That wouldn't be it's the that, harm. It's right. that it triggers it. It it basically keeps that craving alive, right. Rather than allowing me right, to right. transcend it, and it doesn't allow your taste buds to adapt, right? I mean, so, I mean, we our taste buds have been so deadened by this deadened by the hyper salty, yeah. hyper sweet, hyper fatty foods, such that natural foods don't taste any good, mm-hmm. and so then you feel like some kind of aesthetic monk where you just eat. But give it a few weeks, and all of a sudden, you know, the soup salted to taste weeks ago. We have these great studies. So it's actually too salty. You prefer lower salt soup. Um, and the same thing happens with, you know, but look, the ripest peach in the world tastes sour after a bowl of Fruit Loops, like you know, natural food. But all of a sudden, you get to a point where if you start, if you get rid of all that crap, then all of a sudden, you know, uh, corn on the cob, no butter, no salt, tastes delicious, like natural, healthy, whole food. Then you get the best of both worlds. Wait a second. Taste delicious and you get to live longer. That's what plant-based eating is all about. But you may never get there if you, you know, well, have a little cheese here, a little cheese there. You maintain that because yeah, you palate. can't make that. Yeah, exactly. And then, and then, then okay, I'm going to be good, eat that salad. And the salad doesn't t- it salad taste like cardboard because, you know, it doesn't have the same kind of, yeah. Right. I, uh, I know that to be true because I've experienced that in my life. But I think people hearing that think it's bullshit. Like they're like, uh, yeah. they can't believe, they can't believe that that's true. They're like, that sounds great, but there's no way. Yeah, no, it's, you know? yeah, it's got to have the face. Yeah. face. And the, the right, other right, observation right. That I have about this is that I don't think people are very good objective. Uh, they're, they're not objective about, about what they're truly doing. Like when they say, oh, I'm having a little bit of this or I have mm. a moderate amount of this, I think their their perception of that moderation is is generally, in my experience, completely out of whack. No, in fact, um, there's a great study that uh, I talked about in, in the new book where, and, and this is the reason why moderation, why food industry loves moderation. They asked people what they thought a moderate amount of chocolate would be, moderate amount of you know processed meat, moderate amount, of, they go through all these foods, right? And what was the definition of moderate? Exactly how much they themselves were eating. No matter how much they were eating, that was defined yeah. as moderate based on their own intake. They're eating a chocolate bar every day. That's moderate intake. And so, so when the food industry says every, in moderation, that's, that's, that's basically giving people license to do exactly what they were doing before because they all everyone thinks that they're eating moderate amounts of bad food. Right. Amazing. And it goes back to the psychology of all of this. It really isn't about the information. It's about it's about people's emotional, you know, baggage around all of this stuff. And I, I really think that that is the biggest barrier. Like when somebody says I can't lose weight or whatever, there's mm. there's a whole, you know, package there that needs to be, you know, really deconstructed in order to get that person, you know, acclimated towards a new way of living and eating. And, and I have a chapter in the book talking about those psychological – we have these glitches, right? So I talk about like in psychology literature, they call it the what the hell effect. That's the – you know, eat one cookie and then you eat the whole bag right. because, well, I already screwed up. I, which makes absolutely no sense. Just take a step back. Wait a second. So I, I made one step away from what my plan so I'm just going to go out. That makes absolutely no <laughs> sense. In fact, you eat that one, then you definitely shouldn't eat the whole. But but our <laughs> psychology goes in the absolute wrong direction. And the same thing, then there's a, the, the flip side is making progress towards a goal actually gives people license to, you know, so losing right. weight one week um, is correlated with gaining weight ways. the next way, right? You're, yeah. you're, but just the understanding of that, knowing that that's a glitch, um, that the hope is that you can catch yourself, uh-huh. right? And so, you know, I find myself, you know, uh, after some four hour book signing, you know, the, you know, jet lag to heck, you know, staring at whatever goodies are in my hotel mini bar, right? And have this, my first reaction is like, I, I deserve this. Like, oh my God, I've been, what I went through today. But then I I just, what the hell, you know, I, I just, the self-licensing and I say, no, what I deserve, of course. Mm-hmm. is to be healthy. And so, yeah. I think, I think momentum is underrated mm-hmm. too. Once people get a little practice with this and they're starting to see even the smallest amount of result, positive result, then it, it really like enforces, you know, that drive to, to keep going. And it's almost like an insurance policy or a barrier against those kind of slips. And There's I think- something yeah. mystical about that. And, and that does argue towards the more, if you're going to try it, go all in. 
as opposed to the 80, 90%, right? If you're going to try like a free sample, right? That's what I used to tell my patients, right? Try like a free, look, you can eat anything for a few weeks. You can eat nothing for a few weeks. I mean, let's just, let's try it. Let's go all in just for, you know, and because people can't stomach the thought of I'm never going to eat another pepperoni pizza the rest of my life. Like, this is unthinkable. But like, no, 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 just a couple of weeks. Then we can go right back to eating whatever you want. You know, just give it a try. I mean, the, but but the hope is that they go all in, they start to feel the benefits, mm-hmm. right? So they're, they're less painful periods, they're, they're chronic migraines, whatever, whatever it is, such that then they have that internal motivation, even if they don't take advantage and they do slip back to their old ways, they know at least in the back of their mind, they know how good they could feel at any time if they just moved in that direction. But you don't know how good you're going to feel till you give it a try. What changes would you make to our system of healthcare if you were in charge? I mean, you know, listen, nobody goes into medicine to, you know, just be a a vehicle for, for diagnosis and prescription, you know, but the system is set up to create a dynamic that forces medical practitioners into this kind of practice that, you know, isn't really necessarily, I would imagine what they thought they were signing up for. Yeah, I mean, it's really the, I mean, in fact, if you look at the mental health statistics of uh, practitioners these days, uh, particularly in the United States, um, this is not what we kind of signed up for because most of what comes in our door, about 80% in primary care, are these chronic diseases for which we have very little to offer our patients in kind of the traditional medical model, right? We can slow down the rate at which you go blind, at which you lose your kidney function. We can slow down the rate at which you know, your arteries clog off by, you know, prescribing these drugs. We only have a little time, so we give these prescriptions. But uh, instead of giving fully informed consent that, well, here's your other options that I don't have time to tell you about and are, may work better and less side effects. But, I mean, the, the system is set up to kind of reward bad behavior. The most profitable doctor visit in North America is a blood pressure check. Um, doctors love it. Everybody loves it. You can bill for it. They come in, they're on a blood pressure medication. They come in every, and then you tweak the drug a little bit and they come back. It's the easiest, you know, is you fit it in a few minutes, you get to bill for it. Um, and, and it's the most common primary care visit Uh and for a condition that need not happen at all, it's a lifestyle disease, high blood pressure, lifestyle disease. But that entire sector of the field would be gone, both big pharma and, and big medicine. I mean, no one benefits from people eating healthier. I mean, if you go down the list, like the junk food industry, the, I mean, name one industry that would, that would benefit from people eating healthier. And you say, well, what about the health insurance industry? Don't they benefit from people eat because they have to pay for it all? No, they get a slice of the pie. And the bigger the pie, the bigger the slice. I mean, that, you know, when I, when I get to talk to these you know, healthcare executives at these conferences, first of all, they'll say, well, you know, they're only going to be on my insurance for a few years. I'm going to switch, people switch insurance so frequently. Uh, Why am I going to prevent their diabetes and have some other company benefit from my preventing their Uh diabetes? And it's the pie. I mean, it's just so expensive and and they, they get their cut. And the more expensive it is, the bigger the cut. And it's just the whole system is rigged kind of against us. Um, You know, the, the CEOs of junk food companies aren't sitting around trying to, think of way, creative ways to contribute to the childhood obesity epidemic. They just need to make money for their shareholders. How do you do that? You don't do that selling something that goes bad, like produce, that you can't brand, you can't make it. You want a snack cake that sits on the shelf, right? I mean, I mean, the system is just set up to, to you know, reward these behaviors that make people sick. Yeah, so how do we change the incentivization so that we get more Robert Osfelds and Michelle McMackins yeah, yeah. who yeah, are... Yeah. Who you know have created practices where they have follow up and accountability, and they're thing. they're you know providing that kind of extra level of care to help people make these lifestyle shifts. Like there has to be an economic structure mm-hmm. that 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 you know makes it attractive for mm-hmm. young doctors to enter into this. Yeah. So I mean, it's a reimbursement. I mean, that's a, you know Dean Ornish had this yeah. famous quote saying that you know he thought it was the research, but no, it's all about reimbursement. You know, so he proved back in 1990. Right. Decades ago, you could reverse heart disease, number one killer. And, you know, as you know, hundreds of thousands of people continue to die every year needlessly because it's the, the, the lifestyle approaches isn't reimbursed. And so, yes, some people can fight against the, um, the, the buck, the trend and find 
creative ways um, to uh, like these uh, shared medical visits where you can um, bill insurance. You, there's actually no technical maximum for the number of, of people you can get. So you can get 30 people in a room and you can bill insurance for each of those 30 people and give the same little speech that you'd give for a group of diabetics or a group of um, uh, people with obesity. Um, and so that's one of the kind of ways that within the system, um, docs have been able to to get reimbursed. But yeah, I mean, we just need to change the incentives. Like, why do do U.S. taxpayers subsidize by the billions the uh, the sugar industry, the corn syrup industry, the the uh, make cheap livestock feed for dollar mm-hmm. menu burgers? Why 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 are we paying a quarter billion dollars to the sorghum industry? I'm buying some sorghum now because I love it, but I didn't even know about it a few <laughs> months ago, right? No, it's all fed to livestock, uh-huh. and so I mean. It, now, you can argue we shouldn't be subsidizing, the government shouldn't be subsidizing foods at all. But if you're going to subsidize foods, how about subsidizing fruits and vegetables, making them cheaper, even free? Um, to, and because then they'll have all sorts of knock on benefits in terms of uh, lower costs across the board. Yeah, or taking those for, subsidies and, and channeling them into improving health care or creating those incentives. But the, the controversy is around who's going to pay for health care, not what the fundamental health care is going to be. Right. I think Ornish did create a reimbursable program, though. Absolutely. Yeah. Paid, right, paid for, uh, reimbursed by Medicare. Uh, there's two programs now, him and Prinikin. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and I speak at hospitals. I sp- speak at Ornish programs across the country. Right. Um, that's often my in into a medical system um, to kind of promote the program, saying that this option exists. Yeah. So Speaking exciting. of Pritikin, Pritikin, you know, your, your entry point to this whole thing begins with Pritikin. Yeah. Yeah, amazing, right? And not a doctor, right? People always yeah. think Dr. Brick. No, he's an engineer. Came from the outside, diagnosed with uh, with uh, serious heart disease in his uh, early forties, and was and was basically told to go home and die. There's nothing we can do about it. Um, back then, we didn't even have drugs for. I mean, couldn't even put anybody on anything. And people just get worse, 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 and you die. Heart disease reversible? No. But then he looked around the world, found these populations. You know, he's a data guy. He just went and said, "There's populations around the world that don't suffer from epidemic heart disease. Like it's unknown. People just don't have heart attacks in rural." China, Sub-Saharan Africa. Wait a second. What was it about these populations? He figured, oh, maybe it's cholesterol and started experimenting around how we can lower people's cholesterol, came a plant-based diet and reversed, uh, you know, uh, heart disease by the thousands. But back then we didn't have angiography. We didn't have this ability to visualize inside what the arteries were looking like. And so it was a clinical diagnosis. They had angina. They, could, they had such bad heart disease. They couldn't walk up the steps but you just had to trust that the patient had engine. And all of a sudden they go on a plant-based diet and all of a sudden they're, they're running marathons. And the response in the medical community is, well, you never had heart disease in the first place. If you had a heart disease, you wouldn't be running mm-hmm. marathons. Well, but it's because it was simple. But all of a sudden, what Ornish brought to the table is we could prove with something called quantitative angiography. Oh, we can actually see the arteries open up, get bigger, improve blood flow, reversal, proof in black and white, published in some of those prestigious medical journals in the world. And but one of those people that Pritikin reversed their heart disease was Francis Greger, my grandmother, mm-hmm. who, you know, uh, in a wheelchair after so many bypass surgeries, basically run out of plumbing. And there she was and saw about Pritikin on 60 Minutes. Pritikin was featured on 60 Minutes, somehow made the cross-country track one of his earliest patients. She's featured in Pritikin's biography. And she, you know, they wheeled her in and she walked out within a few weeks. She was walking 10 miles a day, went on to live another 31 years to age 96 after her medical death sentence at age 65. And that's what, that's what changed her whole family. I mean, now as a kid, this was all happened when I was, uh-huh. I, I mean, I just, well, yeah, duh, you go to the doctor, you get better. That's what doctors do, right? Little did I know what revolution back then, the mm-hmm. thought that heart disease was reversible, completely revolutionary. Only later in life did I realize what had happened and what my grandma was part of. Was um, Pritikin kind of perceived as a quack in his time? Well, he was, uh, he, I mean, he was putting doctors to shame because he knew the science. I mean, because he had, he had read, read all the, the, the primary literature uh-huh. um, and so would just demolish. There's actually some old YouTube of his debates. He would just demolish opponents because they thought they knew what they were talking about. Of course, they, they, I mean, they were just they're doctors. They weren't taught anything about nutrition. Um, and so, so, I mean, he was just kind of untouchable when, when, when he was actually presenting the science. Um, but they didn't believe his results. His mm-hmm. results were too right. miraculous. And he couldn't prove it beyond these amazing patient testimonials. But, you know, how far does that really go? It doesn't um, uh, until, you know, we have good data to back it up. 
and he inspired everything that you've done. And then right? that's I mean, that's been, how that's why I went like to medicine. Trigger. That's why I I started Nutrition Facts. That's why I wrote How Not to Die. That's why all the proceeds I received from all my books are donated to charity. I just want to do what everyone for everyone's family what Pritikin did for my family. Right. Well, let's round this down. Um, maybe uh, provide a few starting points for somebody that's listening to this. This this information is totally new to that person. They're overweight. They're ready for a change. What's the first thing they do? Go to your local public library and grab How Not to Diet. Check it out. (laughs) Um, And uh, nutritionfacts.org. All my uh, work is free there. No ads, no corporate sponsorship, strictly non-commercial, not selling anything. Just put it up as a public service, as a labor of love, as a tribute to my grandmother. I like how you mentioned the library and not the bookstore. Free books are free, (laughs) literally in your neighborhood. They're just sitting there. (laughs) But if you had to tell them, like, look, I'm ready. I'm I'm staring at my next meal. Like, what should I focus on? What am I? What what are what are a couple foods or some like thumbnail? you know, rules that uh, I can wrap my head around. Yeah, so there, there's these 17 criteria, which make uh, f- for the first part of the book, like being um, rich in fiber, water-rich vegetables, things like that, that that through calorie density mechanisms and improving your microbiome health is, and et cetera, can, you know, can achieve that satiety without calorie restriction or portion control. I mean, that's the, that's the magic of plant-based eating, as opposed to traditional weight loss approaches, is that you know people are told to eat ad libitum, meaning eat as much as you want, um, and and that's because you know you take people, put people on a whole food plant based diet, and you can slash a thousand calories out of their daily diet, cut their caloric intake in half, they don't notice because I mean the, I mean right. they have these crazy. Um, you put people on healthy enough to you, you just couldn't. Some foods are impossible to overeat. 2,000 calories of strawberries, 44 cups of strawberries. You couldn't fit them all in your stomach. Like, you know, I mean, that, you know, that's just, you know, there's, yeah. You know me. <laughs> I go on and on. No. Listen, man, I, uh, I love you. I, you know, I can go out and run really far distances, but I aspire to your level of energy. Uh, you know what I mean? Whatever you got, I want it. Um, and you've been so inspiring to me in my journey. And, uh, I just, I love the impact that you're having on the world and, and it's, it's massive. It's no small thing. You've devoted your life to this cause and you've changed so many other people's lives and it's to be commended. Um, it's an honor to talk to you today. My well, friend. you know what I hear beyond just the documentaries, I heard you on the rich roll podcast and that's why I changed my life. And that's yeah. why I'm here. Good, man. Um, Come back again sometime. Anytime. And you're going to speak at a hospital tonight? That's right. Where am I going? What's the pitch? You don't even know. Do you know what state you're in? (laughs) (laughs) I just looked down my phone and I'm like, oh, I'm going to the airport. I wonder where. (laughs) Yeah. What's the pitch at the hospital tonight? Um, We're going to do weight loss. Uh We're going to do weight loss. Good. All right, my friend. Let's get you out of here. Peace. Mind blowing stuff. Am I right? Hope you guys enjoyed that. If you have any questions or feedback for Dr. G, you can shoot him his way on Instagram at Michael Gregor MD and at nutrition underscore facts on Twitter. Pick up How Not to Diet and his newest audiobook, How to Survive a Pandemic, which are, of course, all linked up in the show notes on the episode page at richroll.com. If you'd like to support our work here on the show, subscribe, rate, and comment on it on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, and on YouTube. Share the show or your favorite episodes with friends or on social media. And you can support us on Patreon at richroll.com forward slash donate. Thank you to everybody who helped put on this show today. Jason Camiello for audio engineering, production, show notes, and interstitial music. Blake Curtis and Margot Lubin for videoing today's show and creating all the social media Clips that I share, Jessica Miranda for graphics, Allie Rogers for portraits, Georgia Whaley for copywriting, and DK for advertiser relationships. Theme music, as always, by Tyler Pyatt, Trapper Pyatt, and Hari Mathis. Thanks for the love, you guys. See you back here in a couple days with another cool episode to be determined. Until then, peace. Plants. Namaste.